Wow. Eight, eight seconds. There you go. Does that mean I get an extra 13 seconds from you all after class? I think I've taken more than 13 seconds over the past three years I've been here already, so we'll just call it even at that. Uh, thank you for your patience as we're getting started tonight. We'll be in John chapter 2. Uh, hopefully more successfully than last week, our plan will be to get through John chapter 4. I'm planning to be try to do a little bit less techie things uh, that were kind of maybe on my end of stuff. Cody took care of some mic things that were going on. We appreciate Cody. Uh, Cody's always taking care of things for us. We appreciate Cody for a lot of stuff, but uh, he took care of whatever poppy thing was happening, so there shouldn't be an issue this evening as well. Continue our studies in John, as eventually we'll be focusing more in the latter half of John, but we're picking up tonight in John chapter 2. And like I said, hopefully making it through most of John chapter 4, at least the woman at the well story, and looking at that situation in there and that, what's going on there with that particular instance. Uh, we may not get to the second sign at the end of that chapter, but that's okay. We can pick that up then next Wednesday. Before we get any farther, though, uh, let's continue to um, remember those that we've been making mention of being sick. Uh, Kathy's doing better, so she's probably going to stay in at least one more service time together to make sure she's completely recovered. Uh, continue to remember Sister Ron's after a procedure yesterday that went well, um, but still has probably a long recovery ahead of her for that, and others who might still be traveling their way tonight, too. Let's pray together as we get started this evening. Will you pray with me, please? Our Almighty Heavenly Father, we approach your throne at this time, giving you praise and glory for the amazing God that you are. We want to humble ourselves and remember that you are holy and awesome and magnificent and wise. And, and then, Father, as we just contemplate you, we are thankful for this chance we have to be together to learn about you, to be encouraged as brothers and sisters in Christ through opening your word, to hear from you as you speak to us through the scriptures, and we pray that you would be with us and help us to be good students of your word tonight, as be with our eyes and minds as we observe and look to interpret the things that we find therein that help us to see the big picture and big themes of John and to help us to either grow into belief or to continue to grow deeper in our belief of Jesus as the Son of God and as the one who provides eternal life. As we Spend time in your word tonight, and spend time, as all the other teachers spend time teaching their classes tonight, too, we pray that these will all be blessings for us, that we discuss and learn together, and that uh, the seed will be planted, and that will help to continue to grow, that it ultimately will bear fruit for your glory. Continue to be with those who are traveling the way here this evening, and give them safety, and thank you for this rain today, we pray that they'll be safe in the rain on the rest of their way here. We're so grateful for uh, the, the answered prayers that you've given us, for those who are doing better, continue to pray for Sister Rhonda, for others who have been sick as well, that you would continue to watch over them. And as there's a lot of things that go around per usual this time of year, keep us healthy and keep us safe as we look to continue to uh, have times like this together. We thank you so much for Jesus. And as we think about him tonight and focus on him, help us to have our hearts open to uh, continue to appreciate him and to love him and to grow in that love for him as we learn about him through uh, this gospel. We're thankful for the salvation, for forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life that comes through Christ. And in his name we humbly pray. Amen. Last week we uh, made our way through chapter 1, talking about kind of some of the big themes in there of understanding who Jesus is and looking at the introduction of Jesus through John the Baptist ministry that quickly points the spotlight to Jesus and looking at the belief that are already starting to come into people's minds. If you're in John chapter 2, Look up to John chapter 1, verse 50 and verse 51, and this interaction with Nathaniel. Jesus helps Nathaniel recognize that, uh, you know, I know where you were when you were sitting under the tree, and Nathaniel kind of goes from doubting and questioning to maybe a little bit more ready to accept Jesus and all the things he says about him and praising him. And verse 49, Rabbi, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus says in John 1, 50, he answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? you will see greater things than these. He said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. As John will emphasize signs that we're about to talk about here in just a moment as we get into John chapter 2, or there'll be certain things that aren't necessarily specified as signs, but Jesus knowing where Nathaniel was and telling Nathaniel that and that giving Nathaniel some clue into some divinity or some type of uh, special knowledge that Jesus has that points him to make these conclusions are things that are amazing, but those are not the things that we anchor to, to say, Jesus 
does this sign, or Jesus saw this thing. Those things point us to Jesus himself and who he is. And while there are more things to be seen, as we'll look at them this evening and through the rest of the book, we recognize and see that these things, again, are not pointing us to say, he turned water to wine. Isn't that amazing that he did that and that uh, you know, maybe we could do something like that too? Obviously, we're not at all trying to make that application in what, any type of point this, tonight. But we are looking to see and learn about Jesus and who he is. So that takes us to our first time tonight uh, in John chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 11. Can I get some help doing some reading this evening? Can someone read John chapter 2, 1 through 11 for me? Clint, I'm seeing the beginning of a raised hand. Would you mind doing that, please? Thank you, Clint. So we see that Jesus turns this water into wine at this wedding. There are some things to note about the amount of wine, the quality of the wine. There's a quantity and quality aspect in that. Uh, we'll notice also seeing that Jesus shows the ability as creator to manipulate whatever substance would have been, the molecules that would make water, water H2O, and turn them into something that is changed into wine uh, to, make our, to remind ourselves of that. Um, we see in verse 9, the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine. I don't think this is just, this is water that tasted sweeter. It tasted like it changed into something else. But Jesus' main purpose is not to do the signs. Now, don't misunderstand it to say the signs aren't important or the signs are irrelevant. But the main purpose of Jesus coming is not to do the signs. Kind of some of the background is that from what we see in the conversation with Jesus and his mother, when the fact that she says something to him about, hey, they're out of wine. There's probably a lot more you could look into that about uh, Jewish wedding feasts and kind of the expectation of who would be hosting that and the amount of wine that should be allowed and maybe why is Jesus' mother having these intuitions that he could probably do something about all of this. But I want to emphasize and notice and see in verse 4 is again the phrase we've talked about some already in John, at the end of that, what my hour has not yet come. The signs that Jesus are doing are not his hour. That's not why Jesus is here is to do the signs. They're pointing to what's the message of why he's here, the, the reason he's here, his glorification from the Father, ultimately through his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection. We could probably talk about his ascension in there too, although John doesn't mention the ascension specifically at the end of the gospel. We know that's part of the story as well. That's what the signs are pointing us towards. Uh, and to see that Jesus is manifesting his glory so that people are prompted to believe in him, like his disciples are here. This isn't really like some, I have to be careful with my words, this isn't some big miraculous event. It is a miraculous event. But what we mean by saying that is not, it's not Jesus steps out into the busiest section of Jerusalem at this point and says, attention everyone, and he raises all the dead people in the whole city or anything like that. There's not some big grand gesture here. And I think one of the things we can see from that relating to what Jesus says specifically is the fact that Jesus is saying, my hour has not yet come. There's misconceptions about the Messiah. People think the Messiah is something that Jesus is not claiming to be or does not want people to think that he is. We can see that even more as we'll get to John chapter 6 when they're ready to take him, make him king. But for now, he's doing this sign so the disciples believe in him. And obviously some people at the feast will believe or at this wedding feast will believe in him and come to some belief. And hopefully we'll make that connection, that he is the one who has this power as creator of things and provider of things in this beautiful way. 
But ultimately, this is pointing to that manifestation of his glory there in that moment. And that's what we want to focus on what we see from this particular sign. So anything, that's kind of the, the hope, is that we're going to take some of these sections. We'll have a couple of quick, brief thoughts. Uh, any comments or questions here in these first 11 verses Briefly, that we want to make note, of, maybe for our notes, an overview sheet, or questions you have that we can uh, try to address here, or we can address after class before we move on. All right, let's pick up then in John chapter 2. Can I get someone to read John chapter 2, 12 through 25, please? Who can do John chapter 2, 12 through 25? Blaine, if you would please, sir. Thank you, Bling. So Jesus makes a trip to Jerusalem for the first Passover. There's at least three, maybe four Passover feasts that Jesus goes to Jerusalem for, as well as some other feasts that we'll notice as we spend some time in the book of John. Uh, as he's at this, there's a very memorable event that takes place of Jesus cleansing the temple. Uh, you're probably familiar with the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, how they have a similar sounding event, or maybe even a similar description of the same event at the end of those. I believe this is two different things that happen, one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, one at the end of Jesus' ministry. I'm more than happy at an 8.05 conversation tonight to talk more if you have a different position about that or other thoughts about that. But kind of working with that frame right now towards the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is cleansing the temple as he goes to Jerusalem for this Passover. Uh, and we have the statement here, uh, I'm going to be back on John chapter 2, not trying to get into John chapter 3 quite yet. He makes the statement in verse 16, take these things away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. Um, we'll talk about the disciple statement in a second. He's driving out these money changers and making a point here that the place that's devoted to worship is not to be tainted with financial convenience and business. That they've taken this place that should be a focus for worship and particularly, um, I think I can at least do this without messing anything up if I get the laser pointer. So the court of the Gentiles in this area this is probably that area where they're doing that money changing. Now, there is precedent in the old law for if you have to travel from somewhere far away, you can convert whatever you would sacrifice into some type of coinage or money. And when you get to what either would have been the tabernacle or eventually the temple, you can exchange that. But as they're doing that, that shouldn't be happening in a place where people are trying to worship. Uh, no, you have the court of the Gentiles, you would have inside of that for some of the Jewish women, the court of women, and then within uh, this section itself, obviously only the priests are going in the temple, and it's not like that they're just lounging about the temple all the time. We remember how holy the temple is and the purpose of the temple, we're representing God's presence here. But Jesus is talking about this and cleansing the temple, uh, and from all of that, uh, we understand that he's making this point about how they've tainted worship and made it about something that or made the whole situation about something that's so far away from worship. His disciples make this connection, and there's varying opinions about, do they make this connection, like when this story took place? Is this John giving a little bit of, they looked back at it, and then they kind of made the connection deal, this passage from Psalm 69 and verse 9 about this suffering servant who says, zeal for your house will consume me. Uh, 
either way, they make this connection that Jesus is represented in this figure that's talked about, this, this one who's suffering but glorifying God at the same time that's mentioned in Psalm 69. Uh, later on the, throughout this, you see the disciples talking about how they rec- realize that you know, when Jesus is talking about the temple, you're going to tear it down and I'm going to build it back up. He's not talking about Herod's temple that's taken so long to build. He's talking about his body. And it even says again in verse 22, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture, probably something either about the resurrection in general, like Psalm 16, maybe it's believed the scripture from Psalm 69, that quotation there. They believed that, and that Jesus had spoken, again, pointing that to Jesus. Uh, something to see with this, though, is that Jesus is the place where God dwells and where atonement is found. As he's talking about the temple in this way and talks about how he's going to raise the temple in three days, he's not talking about Herod's temple. Herod's temple will get destroyed, but Jesus is talking about his body. And he is, people use it, talk about various ways. The way I'm going to use it this evening, I'm going to talk about he takes on the role of the temple. Uh, If you can maybe help me express that better, I'll try to express it now, explain it. The idea that Jesus is uh, fulfilling the Old Testament of the worship and those types of things. It says, if you want to have fellowship with God, if you want to dwell with God, if you want to find forgiveness of your sins, it's not going to come through the temple in Jerusalem, which is what that's representative of. It's going to come through Jesus himself. And he's making that point here, trying to get his audience to see that. And that's happening here, I believe, at the beginning of his ministry. And then maybe after a couple of years, people have kind of gone back in some of their system of doing things they wanted to do. And we see a similar cleansing happening in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Moving from that particular section, though, to the rest of the chapter, while he's in Jerusalem, there are plenty more people who are believing in him. There's some interesting things going on in verses 22, or verse 23 through verse 25. People are believing him when they see the signs he's doing. There's obviously other signs that Jesus does that John doesn't record for us. We can see some of those in the Gospels, or we can see them in other places, or even if it's just not specifically mentioned, we know Jesus does other signs. But the kind of ironic wordplay that's mentioned in here comes in the fact that many people believed in his name. In verse 24, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. In the English Standard Version, that's entrust in verse 24, and that's the same word believe in verse 23 when it comes to the people. The people are believing in Jesus, but Jesus is able to see that not all believing is equal because the belief they have the way I'm understanding this passage is, seems to be a superficial belief or a shallow belief and that they're not really recognizing who Jesus is as the Son of God. And the point is made in verse 25, he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And we're going to see that fleshed out even more, particularly over two of the major sections we're going to see in these next two chapters with Jesus having a conversation with a Jewish leader And as he's able to steer that conversation to where that Jewish leader really needs it to go, not necessarily maybe where the Jewish leader is expecting it to go, not maybe where he is kind of wanting to take it at times. And the same thing with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Jesus knows where that conversation needs to go for her. And even though she at times seems to kind of try to back out of the situation or back out of the conversation, or maybe she's trying to steer it in another direction, Jesus knows the hearts of these people, and we see that played out through these particular episodes. But other things about John 12, whether it be with the cleansing of the temple, uh, other things we want to note before we move on. Yes, sir, Brother Patrick. Mm-hmm. Um, he tells them, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Right. So the two signs are these figures of three days and then something happening afterwards. So it's just that and that's a continual theme in, in the preaching of Jesus. But he just says, this is going to be the sign. Yeah. My death, burial, and resurrection, that's going to be the ultimate sign. Whether you look at it in the destruction of the temple,
Right. I think that uh, to kind of talk a little bit about what Brother Patrick is talk, talking there about some of those things of how Jesus wants them to view Scripture. If you go later to John chapter 5, you get, for example, somewhere like verse 39, John 5, 39. You search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and is they that bear witness about me. You have Luke 24. You have John chapter 8 a little bit. You have the end of John we talked about a couple of weeks ago briefly. You see this idea. Uh, one writer, it, the term is on my mind just because I've recently heard this term. He talks about how Jesus is kind of trying to train his audience, or particularly the gospel writers are trying to train, train their audiences to read Scripture figurally, not figuratively, figurally, to see that there are things and figures that point to Jesus, whether it be things like Jonah, whether it be things like the Psalms. Now, that always needs wisdom and discretion, the things we see very clearly, other things that aren't always expressly stated through the Scripture said so. We can find the pretty clear implications, like we're going to do in John chapter 3 here in just a second with the bronze serpent. Uh, but that is a point that he's trying to get them to see, that especially after the resurrection, you read the whole set of scriptures, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, and you see Jesus is the anchor point of everything. Again, that's, that's a whole conversation that could definitely be fleshed out more, and that's probably a skill and a talent a lot of us need to develop and kind of work into a little bit more, uh, is seeing Jesus in the center of scripture in that way, and, and seeing him in the Old Testament, or seeing how the Old Testament points to him in that regard. We'll see some of that as we continue to read John. Anything else we want to hit briefly in chapter 2 before we move on? So let's get into chapter 3. I'll read verse 1 through verse 21. This is the scene of Jesus and Nicodemus. So I think Jesus is still in Jerusalem at this point. I say that just because we don't have any marker. of It seems like he's moved anywhere else right now. Maybe still around this time of Passover. Read with me John chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 21. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness about what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up and that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. 
Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. He comes by night. Maybe is that some of what Jesus is kind of getting to here? Maybe a little bit of trying to poke at Nicodemus' conscience by talking about the darkness and light situation. Nicodemus has come in a literal time of darkness, and he's trying to help point Nicodemus to the light. We're already familiar with the term light from John chapter 1, and that light term being described as pointing us to, or it is, Jesus from John chapter 1. The word is talked about in that, uh, that first section, the prologue. And as they talk about things, uh, Jesus again points to the scriptures. There's this implication that if you are a teacher of Israel, what is he teaching them? He's, I don't think Jesus is saying you, know, you should know basic math and you should be teaching basic science. He's talking about if you're a teacher of Israel, you should be teaching the scriptures that they know. And so there's a lot in here that have Old Testament references in scriptures. For example, Ezekiel chapter 36 when you look at, uh, before you turn to Ezekiel 36, if you haven't left John 3 yet, look at verse 5. John chapter 3, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's been questions and debates, I don't know if it's for decades or centuries, how long, about is that two things, is that one thing? We see the same thing in Scripture in the Old Testament that talks about that as being two things or one things. I mean, people make the point that's the physical birth and then that's the spiritual birth when the Holy Spirit enters you and gives you this special knowledge of some kind. But you go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 through verse 27, we learn something about the Spirit of God coming upon people. We learn something about them being washed with water, which is not an uncommon term or phrase or reality to see God speaking that way in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So as you look at something like John chapter 3, as we hear being born of water, there's probably already a lot of connection, and I imagine many of this audience's mind, things related to baptism. I think that's part of the equation here. We recognize it's not just talking about baptism. I think we see ideas of repentance when we put the connection to the Ezekiel 36 passage, where Ezekiel 36, God's talking about restoring his people after they've been in rebellion against him, and he's going to help them to find that way that they need to, to follow. And that's going to be the way that leads them to this new life, to this new spirit, this new heart that they have. Uh, so there's going to need a belief to trust in God. There's going to need to be repentance as that heart changes from that heart of stone and rebellion to a heart that's tender to receive the gospel and the message of God. And as they would be born again and start that new walk and be a part of that new birth, from there that they would receive God's spirit as it's talked about in places in the New Testament, not in some miraculous uh, indwelling, maybe as some of our denominational friends talk about, but I'm just going to summarize it like that for this evening but it does talk about God's Spirit being given to them in this way. There's other passages, I think Daniel chapter 7, I think Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you go back to John chapter 3, and you look around verse 13 and verse 14, uh, there's a, uh, some connections to those particular passages. I try to remind myself that not every time you see Son of Man is Jesus always calling Daniel 7 to mind, I would imagine, but I think pretty often there's that picture. And particularly in John chapter 3, in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In Daniel chapter 7, if you don't remember that text in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, one is called who looks like the Son of Man to go up to the, the eternal one, to the Father, and he is given a kingdom. And the implication is that one who has ascended has come down now and is preaching the message of the kingdom and will return to the Father when he receives that kingdom. Help me with that, Miss Rebecca? Okay, go ahead. If you go to 
I'll give you one more with it for now, if you yeah. can do that. Okay. okay. That's where connected, put on Christ. Well, no, it's in about 15. It says, For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. How do we become new creatures? We don't become new creatures until we are baptized. Right. And I don't think we emphasize that. And I don't think that's about why a lot of people probably think baptism is tense and act. It's just something you have to do. There's a thought of, I'm already a new creature, so why would I need to be baptized? But that's just something we can emphasize from Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. So to summarize some of what Mr. Beck is talking about, she mentioned, uh, you mentioned Romans 6, you mentioned 1 Corinthians 5, 17, Hebrews and Galatians in there as well. The point being, a birth is the start of something, maybe not the end of something. We had a conversation like that recently. Is that maybe a part of a summation to kind of what you're talking about? Maybe we sometimes think of it's the end goal, but rather if we talk about it as it's the start of the relationship, that kind of helps to maybe plant the seed into someone's mind who thinks, well, I'm already a Christian. Why would I need to be baptized? Well, when we're looking at things like a new birth, um, we see, you know, you start your new life. That's something that happens when we're born. And we recognize that that's what baptism is talked about there in that perspective. And so I think that's something that Nicodemus has a hard time getting his mind around because he's thinking in a very literal sense. But Jesus is trying to point him to spiritual things as someone who knows the hearts of man. This conversation that is all going on, though, uh, you know, it talks about some of these deep things. It talks about being born again. It talks about the spirit. It talks about some of these figures, even as well in the Old Testament. The conversation, I mean, we're probably very familiar with verse 16. What's Jesus' focus, he's talking about how people can have that eternal life. It starts with being born again, that they would have that life. Remind ourselves that in this text, the context of John 3.16, which surely deserves all the attention that people give it to, but let's also to remember to put it in the context of as we talk about it as well. It's not God's plan of condemnation. It's God's plan of what would be maybe the opposite of condemnation. Salvation. It's God's plan of salvation. That's how we talk about it, right? And that's how Jesus talks about it in here. He talks about the fact that these are the things we need to do. That's why I've come. Not that people would be condemned. God could have just left things as they were, and that would have continued to be the path people had gone down. But God, because of his love for people, sent his son so there could be salvation. So rather than people, if people take this position that God is just out to get me, you need to try to help them work through that so we to see God's position towards you is that he loves you and wants you to be saved. And how you respond to that is up to you. You can either stay in the darkness or you can come to the light. You have that free will, but recognize the consequences come with that too. I do need to, I see it, maybe the, is that a start of a comment or something? I'm not going to get to it tonight, so I'll have to move that to, I want to finish this chapter at least. So let's get through the rest of chapter three and we'll have to pick up in chapter four next week. This section in chapter 3, the rest of the section, picking up from John the Baptist uh, into just a couple of thoughts here. I think chapter 3, verse 36, helps put a good bow on where we want to end tonight. Um, in chapter 5, if I can get you to at least direct your eyes there briefly, John chapter 5, verse 33 through verse 35, John is described as uh, a lamp in John 5 and verse 35. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. I mentioned that text there just because of this quotation that has stuck with me, that within this section of John chapter 3, one person phrased it this way, that the lamp has done its work and now the light must shine. And the lamp is there and it's a source of light, but it's nothing compared to the true light. And that's ultimately what John's point is getting to in here. John chapter 3, 22 through 36. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because their water was plentiful there. People were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples over, and a Jew over purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, 
He who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, and I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what has been seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things to his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Obviously, there's the section in there with John, but I really want to kind of move towards the end of the chapter as we're closing tonight. Particularly as we're thinking about the Gospel of John is looking to help us to either develop faith or to grow in faith. And obviously, a passage like John chapter 3, verse 16 makes the important knowledge of, makes the important statement about faith and how important faith is in our relationship with God. How we need to respond to God's grace and to his love for us. But recognizing that how we respond to God matters. And then when we talk about faith, we want to try to understand, well, what does that mean? And if we try to just lock ourselves in this one passage, it may be easy to say, well, belief is just, you know, I just believe, and that's all that it is. Well, John talks about that a little bit more at the end of this chapter. So if someone wants to talk about John chapter 3, verse 16 with you, you know, or maybe talk about some new birth things, you're talking about maybe is it, I just have to believe things. Let's close with verse 36 tonight, and this point of seeing whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, there's some difference in translations with the rest of the verse, but let's see what we get as we close with that tonight. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not, what do we have? Obey. Some versions will say believe there, but you see there's a connection between belief and obedience, that there are people who believe in the Son, they have life. The person who does not obey the Son, who does not believe in the Son, will face uh, the wrath of God, and the wrath of God remains on him. Now, I think that... Or, to put all that together to say belief shows action and obedience in this. And that's what he's trying to get Nicodemus to see. As Nicodemus is probably already confused about a lot of stuff, and we're going to see Nicodemus grow throughout this book, which is an amazing thing that I didn't really notice until a couple of years ago that Nicodemus comes up a couple of times again, and we see his faith in Jesus kind of growing. We see that faith is not just, I just believe. It's an action. It's an obedience that comes with this as well. And that's kind of where we're leaving off for the time being, the end of this conversation in Jerusalem. We'll pause there. We'll pick up in chapter 4 next week. Again, as we're moving through some of these early chapters, trying to get some highlights of big things, a couple of points along the way. If you're interested in extra notes, extra Old Testament quotations that can kind of go with some of the points we're seeing about Jesus. I didn't get to mention Malachi chapter 3 and John chapter 2, but there's a good Malachi 3 reference connected to the temple there. If you want that after class, I can get that to you. But otherwise, we'll pick up in John chapter 4 next week. Thank you so much for your presence and participation this evening.